Thank you. All right, wonderful to be here. I would like to be close to stand. Uh, there's a camera. Uh, so hello, friends online. Hello, folks in the audience. Uh, sometimes when you go places, you want to talk about your science. I love talking about science, and hopefully I'll get to share some of those science stories with you. Uh, but sometimes it's, it's nice to sort of reflect on how we do science, why we do science, the barriers that we encounter, and how to overcome them. And so today's presentation is a little bit different, I think, probably than, than most of you. Uh, you've taken in. And I really like to think about it as a conversation starter. Some of those conversations will hopefully extend over lunch, or pizza lunch after, or hang out with any of you then. But there are also sort of conversation starters that might extend into lab meetings focused around one of these topics. So the way I've set things up today is uh, we're going to do some myth busting. So I'm going to uh, present a series of myths, and then I'm going to dispel them as we, we work our way through. So uh, myth, dispel, myth, dispel. So that's sort of how the how it, it's structured. Um, positionality. So uh, I'm a uh, a white male, fair amount of privilege, uh, and that has shaped the experiences that I've had, my lived experiences, and therefore the barriers that I've encountered. Okay. So so keep in mind what I'm sharing today in terms of the, the barriers and myths are things that I hear or that I've experienced, and each of you will have a different set of those. So I just want to just want to share that. Uh, so without further ado, let's move on. Uh, I've tried to frame this to be as, as broadly relevant to folks in biology or environmental science or life sciences as possible, although being a, a fish head and a conservation scientist, you're going to see things lean uh, a little bit in the environmental direction. And I will pull upon uh, my own work as I uh, as I walk us through. And so where did this come from? Why do I want to stop, uh, stand up here and talk about something other than my science? Uh, and it's uh, largely out of frustration. Um, I'm somebody that uh, purports to be an applied ecologist, purports to be a conservation scientist. I'm supposed to be helping to solve problems, generating new knowledge that has impact. Impact, not in terms of impact factor and citations, but how that information is used and embraced and applied by practitioners and policymakers. And this is something that's frustrated me for a while. In fact, that frustration is what led to me founding the Clean Center for Evidence-Based Conservation. Uh, but I've also mused about that in a couple of papers, worked with some students uh, back in a grad course in 2014, thinking about what we needed to do as early career folks, I'm not sure whether I fit in that category, uh, but uh, to be more relevant, to do science that had the, had the potential to have that kind of impact. And then more recently, I've mused about the frustrations that I, I felt as somebody working in that space and how I've tried to, to reconfigure my career uh, and how we do things in our lab to have more impact. So um, I'll just point out off to the side there, you're going to see throughout the presentation a number of these QR codes that will take you to the, the paper. I haven't done it for all the papers, but ones that uh, I thought uh, might resonate with folks. This is kind of like clickbait, right? You're on Facebook, you're supposed to, you got to stick around to myth number 17. Okay, so you, you can't leave. 17 is really important. All right, so this is how we're, we're going to work through this. So here's the first myth, and you can see it bolded up at the top there. And the idea here is the myth is play it safe, stay away from boundaries. And that's something I have absolutely ignored throughout my entire career. Uh, I, I like to learn. I like to meet other people. I like to learn with and from them. And so I find myself increasingly working outside of my comfort zone. Here's a few examples of some boundaries that I've crossed. So that top example is a paper where we explore uh, the differences between the inland and marine realms. And so inland as in freshwater. Uh, and when you think about it, that there are different journals. We go to different conferences. There are different named programs. There's a marine biology program here. There's not a freshwater biology program. It doesn't mean there isn't some expertise in that space, but we do a pretty good job of of trying to separate these things. But there's actually a lot of similarities as we wrote about in that paper. Um, another example, the recreational and commercial sector. So last week I was in Norway and I was at a conference that was focused on uh, fish welfare in the context of commercial fisheries. And I was there as the sole recreational fishing sort of voice to share the lessons learned from, from that realm as an example of the kinds of sharing that can go back and forth uh, in both directions. 
And then finally, uh, environmental studies and environmental science. When I arrived at Carleton, I was in environmental science. My colleagues used to tell me how much better we were than the people in environmental studies. What those people didn't know is my undergrads in environmental studies. Uh, and working with a colleague, uh, we wrote about this, this sort of intersection, this gray area in between, and uh, that, that really they aren't different, different entities. There's a, a fair amount of similarity. So those are a few examples. Um, I've also been involved in sort of creating a boundary space. Uh, I'm the founding editor-in-chief of a journal called Conservation of Physiology, and with Martin Wachelski, Back in uh, 2004, 2006, uh, we wrote a paper in Tree where we coined that term. Um, and that's, there it is up there. And that's developed to the point where we now have a, a textbook, the first textbook we published last year in this space. And that came from thinking about how different things come together, these, these pieces come together. So take home message here. Uh, try to stay away from boundaries that, that are keeping you in and, and jump over them or stand across them, or work in those boundary spaces. Myth number two, that this kind of work is easy. Uh, it's easy to do interdisciplinary research. It requires learning new languages and cultures, which is, I, I want to highlight the word learning there. If you're in university and doing grad studies, you're presumably a lifelong learner, so this should, should come naturally. Um, if it was easy, we would not need books like this, the Oxford Handbook on Interdisciplinarity. Uh, the reason that I do this kind of work is that there are many problems that are simply too complex to go with alone, that one discipline is simply insufficient. I've been fortunate to be able to spend some time thinking in this space. Uh, I led a Royal Society of Canada working group uh, focused on reflecting on what interdisciplinarity meant to us, thinking about the barriers, the enablers, uh, why we do it, the, the value in, in doing so. Uh, what was cool, um, I'll point out 57 co-authors. That included uh, a choreographer, a brain surgeon, a rocket scientist, a musicologist, so really different perspectives brought to bear here. Um, other than the word cloud, I'm not really going to show you much more other than to say that uh, there's certainly challenges with doing it. The payoffs are huge. And we're starting to break down those barriers that make it difficult to do that kind of thing. I know we're still siloed in an academic sense. I would argue that administratively, it's not the leadership that's preventing us from engaging in interdisciplinarity. It's each other. <laughs> it's uh, where we put up predetermined boundaries and say, oh, that's not enough. There's not enough biology in there for that to be a thesis in this department. So, so just like everybody that think about that, especially the, the PIs. Um, I've been fortunate to work with Rachel Kelly, who's an early career scholar at the University of Tasmania, doing some fantastic work. And she assembled a, a team uh, a number of years ago to develop a series of tips. Uh, and she created this fantastic infographic that none of you can see, other than to know that she created one. Um, I'm going to dig into the first one, which is develop an area of expertise. Okay. So, when you think about you know, what you know and, and sort of that breadth and depth, um, we can map that in a couple of ways. So we've sort of got that breadth of skill and we think of that as a generalist, so you can see that bar there. So somebody that has a lot of breadth, but not much depth. Uh, and then conversely, we've got specialists that might not know much about anything else, but they know a whole lot of one talk, okay? Um, we can start to fuse these things together where somebody knows a fair amount about biology and they know a whole lot about cell biology. So that's sort of a T model. Um, there's been suggestion that, well, maybe we need to move towards a, a pi model like you see here. Um, I would argue that this sort of more uh, code approach with different lengths of the, the tines is probably more appropriate and where many of the folks in this, this room that are established would fit, where you've got this sort of general training across this talk, that general skill set. We've got depth in a variety of areas, but that depth varies. So for example, I'm some physiologist, but I'm not a card carrying hardcore physiologist. I don't wear white lab coats yet. Um, and so maybe I'm, you know, as a, from a physiological perspective, maybe I'm one of these shorter bars. As a very my fish ecologist hat, maybe I'm this long bar in the middle here. And so, so I think the point is you do want to have some spe some specialization, some expertise in one area, but also consider where those other complementary spaces are. Realize that that expertise doesn't need to be quite so deep, and think about developing in in this way. 
Uh, that's certainly how I've approached my engagement with uh, interdisciplinarity. All right, the next one. You have to pick to be either a fundamental biologist or an applied biologist. And I would argue it's not an either or, but we always talk about it in that way. We always talk about it as we do fundamental research, we do applied research. To me, it's a continuum and I do both and it's blurry. And I this project might be fit sort of here on the continuum and then this one changes and jumps over here and, and vice versa. And then they feedback and support each other. Um, in the Canadian funding landscape, at least in the ecology sphere, it's way easier to get dollars to do this than it is to do that. But my fundamental research program has benefited immensely from the applied research because it allows us to do big science. And you can't do applied work if you don't understand the foundations. So these things feed in and, and support each other, uh, I think, in really important ways. Um, I'm going to give you an example. So I do work on carryover effects. Uh, Glenn Crossan, who's a professor here, he's on sabbatical, also does a lot of work on, on carryover effects. Uh, and in an ecological context, carryover effects uh, occur where an individual's previous history or experience carryovers uh, and explains a, a, a portion of their performance in a, in a different situation. So it can be in space, it can be through time, it can be across life stages and, and so on. So we've been fortunate to have funding from BC Hydro and NSERF to basically ask a simple question. It's not so simple. How do we get salmon past this dam? But also what are the consequences of fish passage on these animals? So a, a fish that has to swim up this fishway, do they make it to spawning grounds? And so we use some uh, transmitters that tell us about how fast the fish are beating their tails. We calibrate that and that tells us about uh, the percentage of time that the fish are going into anaerobiosis or oxygen depth. And so that's what you can see on the x-axis there, anaerobic recruitment. And then on the y, you can see the probability of passage. So let's start at the top. So we can see there that the fish that pass the dam, those that actually make it to spawning ground, are, are those fish that, uh, that have high levels of anaerobic recruitment. And so you have to get past the dam. Right. Okay. That, that seems intuitive and you have to swim somewhat fast to do that. But when we look at the bottom, the probability of reaching your natal spawning site, if you put too much energy into that anaerobic, um, do too much anaerobic swimming and work really hard, then you're actually less likely to make it to the spawning ground. So there's sort of a sweet spot there. You need to get past the dam, don't overexert yourself, and then you've got a reasonable likelihood of making it to the spawning grounds and actually reproducing. So this is one of the first sort of fishy field tests of the carryover uh, effects concept. Um, a really fundamental concept, something that if we went to BC Hydro and said, we'd like you to fund a study on carryover effects, they would show us the door. Um, so we were able to bring a fundamental concept into understanding an applied problem. And so we've got on the one side our fundamental papers, this is a conceptual paper with Glenn Crossan as an author, where we muse about what these things are and how they work. And then we think about their applied relevance in a, another paper. So again, just showing that connection between the fundamental and the applied. And number four, this one is uh, certainly one that's held by many students. Uh, this idea that your research is worthless and unpublishable if it's not statistically significant. So uh, anything that's not significant, we put in the file drawer. That's led to something called the so-called file drawer effect. Uh, I hear this, this a lot from students. Unfortunately, my results were not significant. There's nothing unfortunate about it. It is what it is. As long as you have robust experimental design and, and decent sample sizes uh, appropriate for a given context. Uh, it, it is what it is. Um, and we know that publication bias is harmful. It, it gives us uh, uh, um, an unrealistic view of the way the world works. Uh, and it also can lead to chasing significance at all costs. This is where we start to see fraud creeping in, bad behavior, bias that we all possess. Uh, and, and so on. Um, and I would argue that this method, me, uh, myth is also held by many reviewers. Uh, I'm a journal editor and I see this frequently. Oh, there wasn't anything significant here. So it's not good enough for that journal. Uh, 
problematic. And, and even editors that will then pass along that in their decision letter and say, oh, because it wasn't significant, you're going to have to send it somewhere else to give you a lower, lower impact factor. So uh, this is something that hopefully is, is changing. Myth number five, natural science alone is sufficient. I love this quote from Richard Cowling, sorry, biologists. Conservation is primarily not about biology, but about people and the choices they make. So that could be how they vote, how they consume, how they spend, how they interact with the environment, and so on. And I love the, the title of this paper, Conservation Means Behavior. This isn't about animal behavior, this is human behavior. That's what footwear conservation is uh, at. And I've got some examples in our lab where... Uh, where we've done this well and not so well. I'm going to start off, well, I'm going to give you the not so well example here. And so in eastern Ontario, there is a commercial fishery. That's a commercial fishing boat, okay? Uh, and they will go out and they will fish 80 coop nets in, a, in small lakes in eastern Ontario at a time. They catch things like bluegill, pumpkin seed, brown bullhead, and so on. They dump them into the bottom of the boat till the boat's as full as possible. They bring it back, shovel it out into garbage cans, and uh, away they, they go. Along the way, they catch turtles, and turtles need oxygen to breathe. Uh, a few can engage in bimodal breathing where they can uh, get some uh, oxygen out of their uh, anal region, but, but by and large, they need to make it to the surface. And of course, this is a NIMBY issue. Who wants commercial fishers operating on their lake where their favorite cottage is, stealing the fish? So commercial fishers hide the nets. They keep them subsurface. So we figured this out with uh, Gabriel Bluan de Maris, who's a turtle prof at the University of Ottawa. He had a grad student. I was sitting on the committee and she reported how she was radio tracking turtles and found an enormous proportion of them dead in nets. She cut them out of the net, which is a federal offense because uh, you can't mess with somebody fishing or hunting activities. That's a different story. Uh, but uh, the point is it opened our eyes to this. We began to study it. The government couldn't pretend this wasn't an issue. So we did a bunch of science. We published 12 or 15 papers on the issue, the, the scope of the issue. We tried all sorts of things. What could we do to exclude the turtles? Could we create a safe chute so that they could, they could get out? And then we went and tried to sell these ideas, what we found worked, to the commercial fishers. And of course, as you can imagine, we didn't get the greatest reception. At that point, we decided, well, maybe we should do some human dimensions work. We should, you know, talk to the commercial fishers. So we did a, a sequential social science survey. So on the back, it's not great timing. Uh, and there were a couple of things that popped up. So first of all, they used to, we found out, they used to be able to harvest turtles about 15 years ago. And nobody told them all of a sudden on day X, you can no longer uh, harvest turtles. Okay? And so they had no idea of that a snapping turtle could be, that they were handling might be 80 years old. They had no idea. Nobody told them about the ecology and biology and the basis for the regulation. In general, we found that gear alterations were unpopular unless somebody else was going to pay for it. Um, or uh, the challenges associated with deployment. So if, if we created these fancy escape mechanisms or barriers to keep turtles out, and that made it more difficult. Well, that, that made their work more challenging. They weren't into that. Um, but I remember, as we were getting booed out of the room, a couple of commercial fishers stood up and said, hey, there's a couple of things here that resonate with me, and I already do them. In fact, I've been doing them for years. And one of them was uh, this idea of putting air spaces in, just little air space. And we tested using jugs, like a, you know, an empty big water jug. And this individual stood up and said, you know what I use? I use beach balls because I can inflate them. They're cheap. I can inflate them inside. When I'm done, they, they collapse down. And you can look around the room and all the commercial fish can sit in there nodding their head. And so this is an example of where we failed to engage in a co-production model from the beginning. We did do some ride-alongs at the beginning, but we just sat there and took notes. We didn't, you know, and then we went off and did our thing and then came back to them. So an example where doing the social science on the front end or alongside and embracing a co-production model, and we'll talk about co-production later, would have gotten us to the solutions much more quickly. Uh, we probably did two or three studies we did not need to do. So uh, an, an example where natural science alone is insufficient to address a conservation problem. Here's a scary one. The myth that decision makers use the best available scientific evidence. 
And I'm just throwing up here these a random assortment of logos from organizations that span regional to national to international, just to show you that this is, you know, it, this is a pervasive uh, issue. I'm not pointing out any of them in particular as being uh, uh, bad actors. Um, really important paper, uh, Andrew Pullen published in uh, 2004. Um, and they did a survey of land managers in the UK, and they just asked them simple questions. You know, how do you base your decisions? Where do you get your information from? Uh, and it turned out that they remained largely experience-based, and it was sticking with the status quo. They would ask their colleagues, what would you do? And not surprisingly, they would say, well, what we've always done. Uh, so rely heavily on tradition, what they know. And so that told us that managers are not making full or systematic use of all the possible evidence there to potentially support their, their decision making. Many of them don't have time to read or they don't have access to the material. Um, we talked to uh, decision makers here in Canada and they said, no, no, it's different here. And we did uh, two, uh, two social science studies in British Columbia and we found the exact same thing. In fact, we call it cross cubicle communication. That's how things work in GFO. So you just stand up, you lean over the cubicle adjacent to you, that's where you get your information. And that's problematic. Even in Canada, we have our GFO science staff pillared and in different buildings or at, at best on different floors from where the decision makers and policy advisors and, and so on uh, are. So this is alarming. Um, that uh, led uh, Bill Sutherland, Andrew Pullen, and others to really push this need for evidence-based conservation. And so uh, in 2014, uh, had Andrew Pullen come to Carleton, and uh, that led us to uh, start the Canadian Center for Evidence-Based Conservation and Environmental Management, where we uh, work with, I'll use the word clients, but this is sort of like a, a not-for-profit consulting firm we, we have embedded within our lab, where we support uh, different uh, agencies and, and allied organizations in doing high-quality evidence syntheses to guide them. So we use uh, systematic, largely systematic reviews, which are the gold standard in medicine, uh, and that's the kind of thing that we, we do to um, deliver the best available information. We turn that into management briefs so that they don't have to read an 80-page document, and, and we're working to build capacity within different organizations, including DFO, Parks, and ECCC. All right, myth number seven. You have to wait until your work is done before you can engage in science communication. So I love doing science communications. Certainly some experts in this room. Um, yeah, I love, you know, splashing out the, the headlines from our papers and putting storyboards together. But the process of doing science is pretty cool and often really resonates with the public. And here's an example. Uh, this is Alice, a PhD student in my lab, and uh, she was doing work on a back lake. Uh, we didn't want to cut down trees to haul in a, a, a more impressive vessel. Uh, so what we did is we hiked in these uh, barrels and wood and scrapping, and Alice created uh, this, this research vessel. I'm sure it's compliant with Transport Canada. Uh, we've got a generator on board, we've got tanks, and she's doing some experiments right there in the field. My kids are on board helping out, so it was that safe, I guess. Um, and threw it on our Facebook page, 7,000 people reached, 1,300 engagements just from saying, hey, look at this. <laughs> crappy, cool boat that, that Alice created to do her thesis. So telling those stories about the challenges you face and how you overcome them can be really quite compelling and resonate with the public. All right, let's talk about science communication a bit more. So the myth, your job is done when your work is published. No, profs get happy, right? Uh, but that's really, in my mind, the starting point for that broader share. Although I would argue that this is the, the idea of co-production communication starts much, much earlier. Um, I've had the opportunity to, to write about this and, and work with some experts. Uh, you'll notice um, uh, Sarah Boone, uh, who's a really amazing uh, science communicator's name on there. Um, I've highlighted a few of these. So these are the 10 things that we push in this paper. Uh, the most two important in my mind are no one listens to your target audience. So, you know, who are you trying to access and how do you meet them where they're at in, in using media that they actually engage with? And then this bottom one here, striving for bi-directional communication. I think usually when we think SciComm, you think somebody like me standing at the front of the room with a megaphone and it's just information viewing 
being spewed out. It's just one direction. You're just the receivers and I'm the, the sender. That's not communication. You know, think about a relationship. Every relationship, when they're relationship problems, everybody, everybody, you know, it's like, oh, there's not, there's insufficient uh, communication. Uh, it's not one person, it's, it's both directions. Well, the word is a uh, And that's one of um, the things trying to figure out how to communicate in an so ongoing manner with relevant yeah, actors, yeah, yeah, exactly. rights holders, whatever the case may be, for a given project. Here's another myth that new knowledge moves rapidly and easily. So there used to be this understanding or assumption that knowledge moved in what in the pipeline type model. So there's you, the knowledge generator at one end, and you write a paper and shove it in the pipeline, send an email, and it ends up on the desk of the knowledge user, fisheries manager. Boom, done. You've done your job. That information is communicated. We now know that's not how information moves or information that sticks moves. Um, it moves through networks in really complex ways. Uh, and it, there's lots of barriers that information will morph and change and, and so on. So, uh, so we need to work hard to help information move. We've done social student surveys working with Nathan Young and Vivian Nguyen uh, in BC, where we've asked stakeholders and managers about uh, the barriers that they face in um, uh, so here's the question. What are barriers to incorporating new scientific findings into actual fisheries management practices? And first of all, uh, they're different. Okay? And when I'm talking stakeholders here, so this, so uh, that term, and as we defined in that paper, does include a range of folks, including uh, NGOs, uh, individuals that sit on fisheries management panels, but are, who are not themselves government and so on. And then here's the actual uh, decision makers. Um, we had to review stakeholders in the title there. This does include indigenous rights holders as well on, on that side. And you can see a lot of things that are going on, a lot of, of difference. Uh, and we hear a lot from the managers that, well, you know, we'd like to make a change, but we can't make a change to just the commercial sector or the recreational sector because that's going to influence the other one. And then there's the indigenous fishing sector. So how do we do this in a fair way? So there's all sorts of reasons why decision paralysis exists. You just sort of stick with the, the status quo. So sometimes it's not the managers aren't getting your science. It's just that the conditions are not right to operationalize. And the other thing we've realized, it's never one paper. It's about synthesis. And that's why we created that, that evidence synthesis center and engage in systematic reviews. It's about a burden of evidence and it takes time. You're, it's unlikely in the span of a thesis, a PhD thesis, four, five, six years, um, that you will be able to see the change arising from the work you've done. When that happens, yay, celebrate, but uh, it can take a lot of time. It took us 10 years to get the fisheries managers in the Fraser River to say back to us, hot water kills salmon. <laughs> hot water kills salmon. We had to hit them over the head with that for 10 years, pile of papers, constant presentations for them to say, hot water till sin. And now they've got management adjustment factors built in. So in hot years, they assume that fewer of them will make it to spawning grounds. They therefore back off on the commercial, uh, on the fishing harvest to allow more of them to get to get there. Or you fish the crap out of them because it's so hot, you know they're gonna die either. Anyway, so two options. All right. Um, on success in applied environmental research. So what is success? Uh, oh, uh, success in environmental research is about outputs, about papers, right? That's what, you know, NSERC, you know, likes to see that we get papers, but we're increasingly seeing that outputs uh, aren't the only thing that matter. We need to think about alternative metrics. Um, so I brought together uh, a bunch of folks, largely from the National Capital Region, because that's the budget that I had. Uh, and we uh, sat around for a couple of days and mused about what success was. Um, and I would argue that increasingly it's how we do our research that will determine if it's taken up uh, more about the, just what the findings are. And the how can be, you know, was it co-produced? Was it done in an ethical way? And so on. I'm going to see on the next slide here if this plays. So let's see how this works. I'm not going to play the whole thing, but we put together. Let's talk about success in applied environmental research. What is it? How can it be achieved? And how do you know when you have achieved it? First, let's define what we mean by success. 
Success in applied environmental science is respectfully conducted, partner-relevant research that is accessible, understandable, and shared with the potential to create an opportunity for change. Given that resources for conducting research are limited, applied research must generate information that is truly relevant and useful, and environmental policymakers and practitioners need and deserve high-quality, applicable environmental evidence. Based on insights from a diverse team of Canadian knowledge generators and knowledge users, here are a series of strategies for achieving success in applied environmental research. Know your networks and fill the gaps. A great place to start is building a network map or visual image of all partners, stakeholders, researchers and other potential members of the team. This will help you see connections among players and to identify gaps that should be filled. Maintain frequent and respectful two-way communication with partners and stakeholders. Ongoing communication from beginning to end is key for success in environmental research. If done well, your relationship will never end but rather evolve through time to meet the needs of all parties. Don't rush relationships. To build trust effectively, engage with participants at the earliest possible moment and dedicate time and resources to ensure there are opportunities for sharing at all steps of the project. Define questions and consider pathways together. Understand what the partner needs and wants out of the relationship and use a collaborative approach to determine the questions your project aims to answer. Be transparent with partners about uncertainty I'm going to move us on. ...and limitations. No matter how good the science, there is always some level of uncertainty, and it is important to make this clear throughout your project. Consider... Okay. Okay. <laughs> Moving on. So, uh, if you want, you can keep watching that on, on YouTube. So, uh, and you'll start to see some crossover some, from some of these topics. They start to, these myths start to bleed into one another. The next one is only scientists do science, and this is where I'm going to introduce you to reintroduce you the idea of uh, co-production. Um, I've been fortunate to be able to work with all sorts of different actors over the uh, over the years. I do a fair amount of work with the recreational fishing sector. Uh, that's Hedrick Wachelka. He's retired from the Canada Revenue Agency, and he is an avid muskie angler. Muskie are called the fish of ten thousand casts. They're really difficult to catch. Uh, Hedrick spent every day for Sean Landsman's master's thesis with Sean in the field. Hedrick was Sean's unpaid master's assistant. He earned, Hedrick in my mind, earned uh, a master's along with Sean and not surprisingly ended up being a co-author of the papers that, uh, that came from that. Hedrick was involved in helping to shape the study design, helping to, helping to fundraise so you could actually do it, helping in the field, helping to interpret the findings and then share them in the Muskies, Muskies Canada community, he's the director of conservation. And so an example of, of uh, co-production. So co-production is something that we've heard a lot about in the last few years. Uh, there's a fantastic special issue of Nature from October 7th, 2018, that uh, I suggest you check out. I love this quote from there. The end product of co-production done well is almost in the intangible. So, uh, so co-production is the idea that you work collaboratively from the very early stage. It takes time, it can be slow, it can be a bumpy road, but it's not a matter of at the end of the day putting a paper on the table and saying, oh, well, you know, here, here it is. They already know what the answer is because they were part of that process. They were involved, they were engaged, they believe in it, they're ready to operationalize it. So you can do this with environmental managers, uh, you can do it with, with any group really. So this is something that uh, spent a lot more time doing. And you saw Hedrick as a co-author there. Um, when we think about what who usually an author is, we oftentimes assume that they are, you know, scientists or trainees. Um, I think we need to rethink that, especially in the applied realm. People that are specialists in doing the co-production, people that are knowledge brokers, people that are experts in science communication, uh, all of those things, people are experts in relationship building. Those are the kinds of things that you need to do before you can do the science. They're essential to doing science in a good way that can be applied. So again, just in this paper, we, 
we suggest a more inclusive approach to authorship that extends beyond those that simply put words on the page. Only adults do science. Uh, so during COVID, lockdown, hanging out at the cottage with my kiddos, and uh, I couldn't stop doing science, so I recruited them. Uh, we ended up on Quirks and Quirks and CBC. Uh, Cam, Josh, and Ben ended up as co-authors on a couple pretty simple uh, little catch and release studies we did just to just to um, occupy our time. Just want to show you what my crack research team looks like. Excellent. Get that fish in the trough. Okay. The length is 235. 235 millimeters. Oh, wow. There's a five pounder down there. I'll try and tag it next. Excellent, Cameron. And the tag number is 20303. Thank you very much. Okay. Let's release that fish. Get it overboard, Josh. Great. And there it goes, swimming away. Nice work, guys. So, I'm not the only one to publish with my kid. Andrew Hendry at McGill uh, has done it a few times. Uh, I saw a few other examples during uh, the pandemic. So, anyway, that was a fun one. Um, authorship should be self-evident. We just had a workshop uh, in our lab a couple of weeks ago uh, uh, alongside uh, some of the other professors uh, at Carleton, uh, Vivian Nguyen, uh, as well. Um, and we spent a lot of time thinking about what authorship is. Uh, there's a variety of things that lead to disputes about who is an author and who isn't. Uh, the inadequate discussion, no guidance, no records of who did what, secrecy, gatekeeping, and of course, power imbalances. Um, but fortunately, there are ways to overcome these things. Certainly, if you hit conflict and pause till you work it out, communicating early and often is, is really important. Uh, there are guidelines that exist, uh, organizations such as COPE, the Committee on Publication Ethics, uh, Counseling Science Editors, and so on, have guidance to help sort these things out, or you can read papers on the topic. Um, and in some cases, you can either hire a mediator or arbiter, or find somebody down the hall that will serve in that role. So we spend a lot of time uh, um, in our lab talking about authorship. Uh, we don't want to uh, uh, be gratuitous, but we also don't want to uh, fail to recognize relevant contributions. Here's another one. Uh, scientists should not engage in advocacy. Uh, this is something that I dispute, but I want to be clear. When I'm advocating for something, I need to say, I, you know, the science says this, my opinion is this. So being very clear about when I'm Steve the scientist versus Steve the citizen. And the reality is that probably a citizen first and my my, as a person, my values and uh, beliefs, uh, those are shaped by culture, those are shaped by my upbringing, by my friends and colleagues, all of those things. So it's impossible to, to fully separate yourself from your, your science, um, but we, we need to be clear when we're engaging with policymakers and managers when it's the science that we're leading with or when it's our own perspective. And I really like this wording, of, it's really about being an honest broker. You know, as a scientist, I think that's really important. And uh, for early career folks, it, you know, so, so important. Being clear about what your science is, but also about the limitations. Science is inherently imperfect. Um, peer review is perfect. Anybody want to argue with me on this one? <laughs> uh, peer, uh, this is a quote from uh, Pedro Perez Nato from uh, Concordia University. Peer review is increasingly about deciding not if, a paper gets published, but where it gets published. I would agree with that statement. That seems a par with, with my experience. Um, Brian Neff and Julian Holden, uh, back in their postdoc grad school, early, I don't know whether they were prompts yet, but back a while ago, they did this uh, interesting exercise where uh, they, they looked at the extent to which uh, peer review was a game of chance. And so basically, if you took the same paper that uh, um, that only half the scientific community would ever recommend acceptance for, and you target six journals sequentially, just by chance alone, there's 80% likelihood that that paper would be accepted, that you will just get to accept with minors or whatever the case may be, just by rolling the dice enough times. And we know that at least 90%, I would say more than that, of papers rejected by one journal end up eventually being published, often unaltered, 
and not necessarily in a lower tier journal. Sometimes I do that too. Like, you know, paper will get rejected at a good journal. Like, oh, thank you. And so uh, send, it, send it elsewhere. Um, and we cite retracted papers. So even when things get published, it doesn't mean that they're all good. And then when we have mechanisms in place to try and clean and maintain the scientific record, we keep, we keep citing them. Fred Juttfeldt um, is, this is a tweet up at the top, and he was referring to Perchgate. The paper was ret uh, retracted in May of 2017. This was uh, in early 2018, and Fred was musing about how it continues to get cited. And every year since that, Fred continues to note how many people continue to cite it. Not for, here's an example of a paper that, you know, represents uh, academic misconduct, but rather, you know, they found that Perch you know, growth is impaired by microplastics, you know, so, uh, so not, not good. All right, we're almost at the end here. This next myth, the sky is falling is the only way to go. So easy way to get headlines, and you can write your scientific papers with headlines uh, like this. Um, but the reality is that there are tons of problems out there, careers worth of problems. Uh, and if you don't know where to find them, here's a couple good examples, and I would argue, if not us, then who will do it? I would also submit that, that the we, the established researchers, scholars of our day, we have failed society. We aren't making meaningful progress on, on many of these issues, in my mind, and so we're just passing the problems along to the next generation. So there's no shortage of opportunities for you to solve. We, I think we know what the problems are. We need to solve them, and I would love to see more paper titles and news stories about those solutions and the being implemented and ideally working. An example of, of where I've been spending more time lately is dealing with freshwater conservation. I do marine and freshwater work, but, but more and more freshwater. Uh, Living Planet Index, you know, and, and it's, it's imperfect, uh, but uh, suggestion that overall populations are down about 83% for freshwater uh, taxa. Uh, um, so certainly problematic relative to 1970s levels. Um, so we wrote our problem paper, but there were other problem papers about this. So uh, just to emphasize that many of those same threats that David Dudgeon review, uh, identified about 15 years before still exist. And there's new ones, and it's only getting worse uh, in terms of our, our demands. Um, and so I was fortunate to be involved in this exercise, uh, a bending the curve exercise organized by WWF, uh, where we identified six actions. You can see them there, improve water quality, manage exploitation of freshwater species and aggregates, and so on. If we do these six things and do them well, there's the potential to bend the curve because the business as usual case is continuing to see us go in the, the wrong direction. Um, we've been working on a, we've got a special issue in development right now with environmental reviews where we dig into each of these even more to try and give them practical examples and case studies out there to practitioners. Those are our frontline workers when it comes to these problems. We need to make sure they've got the right information to act. Um, spinning off of that, this idea of being a problem solver, it doesn't come without some thought. Uh, during the pandemic online, I worked with an undergrad class and we wrote a paper um, that ended up becoming the class activity. And it was about identifying the essential skills for problem solvers and the mindset of problem solvers. And so uh, not solving a problem, there's no specific formula. Um, it, it takes care and thought. And, uh, and some of these things are in, inherent. Some people are just inherently more patient or inherently more more curious, and so you sort of have to rally that your your own superpowers and see what works for for you. And then, I think this is my last one. To be more productive, you just need to work longer. Okay, so we're gonna get some crazy glue and stick your butts to your seats and just stay at the office two four seven. Um, I want to introduce you to Chris Bailey. Uh, he did his PhD at Carleton. I've never met him. It just I stumbled upon his work and it it, it intrigued me. Um, it was called his PhD. He basically did something different every day for 365 days and looked at whether or not that improved his productivity for that day. So it's called formerly your productivity. He's now become a, a life coach and it's now a life productivity. And so distilling his PhD down to one slide, here it is. Um, productivity is a product of time. So you do actually have to put in time, right? It, things aren't magically going to get done. Energy and attention. And this is the quote from his thesis that, that's really important. 
sleep, exercise, and eating well might seem like a cop-out when you just recommend those to somebody, but they're the most obvious solution to the problem of not getting enough done. Okay? So I'm reasonably productive, and people say, you must not sleep. I'm like, no, kind of the opposite. I sleep a whole lot. Uh, if I'm tired, uh, if I can't give something to, uh, the attention it deserves, I'm not being productive. It's not good work time. I'm not getting things done in a, in a good way. So just want to leave that with you. Uh, everything is a science is a team sport, especially in our lab. I'd like to thank the many uh, trainees that I have the fortune of working with every day, past, present, and future. Uh, they've certainly helped to shape these ideas and, and help me try to overcome some of these uh, and dispel some of the myths we shared today. So. Again, a conversation starter. Let's we'll see where this goes. Thanks.